Pacific coast of Canada is a land of mists, tall mountains and sea, of shrouded mysterious distances. Dense forests cover the mountain slopes. From their silent depths, trees 300 feet high soar up into the soft, warm skies. From the great sweep of this land with its peaked mountains and tall trees, the Indians created a culture now fast dying away. But in their prime, the straight, clean totem poles and carved figures of the Indians, the Nas and the Nutka, the Haida, the Stikine and the Skeena, had the firm, soaring grace of the trees themselves. rich flowing canvases of the Canadian painter Emily Carr, the great forest which once inspired the Indians comes again to life. Her art is the fullest expression of a land which even to some Canadians still seems distant and strange. Emily Carr was born in Victoria, British Columbia in 1871, the daughter of a well-to-do English merchant. The domestic atmosphere of this pioneer city contrasted oddly with the exotic coast vegetation. In nearby parks, expatriate English strove to reproduce Battersea and Kensington Gardens. But beyond the formal flower beds, the rose bushes and tame ducks loomed always the untamed landscape. Even man, in his conquest of it, only contrived to make this landscape more alien. This was the land the Indians knew. To Emily Carr, it spoke with a strong voice. As a young woman, she went by fishing boat, launch, and even by Indian dugout canoe to the little Indian villages along the coast pressed between the mountains and the sea. There she saw the relics of their civilization, their totem poles, their carvings of animals. The Thunderbird, spirit of the storm, and a constant symbol in all West Coast Indian mythology. There she learned to know the Indians and to live among them. They called her Clee Wick, the Laughing One.
They took her right into their lives as one of themselves. In this early period of her work, Emily Carr was concerned with what she painted rather than how she painted it. She was fascinated by the Indians, their life and their art, and she painted them in much the same way that a reporter would tell a story. But though her art of this period is factual, it is already strong and vital and has an individual quality. Before the last war, Emily Carr found that she could not live by her painting. She bred sheepdogs. She opened a rooming house. But the Indian country called her back, and by the late twenties she was again painting with new strength and understanding. canvases, the great totems of the West Coast Indians become a living art, painted with a great breadth and sympathy. now began to travel to back roads of Vancouver Island and to paint the great rainforest of British Columbia. Now the feeling for form became more evident in her work. At the same time, her paintings of Indian life broadened. Their color became richer and she seemed in each new canvas to grasp more firmly the spirit of the forest. Deep down in the dim, scented darkness of Cathedral Grove on Vancouver Island, the 400-year-old firs at last find their roots on the forest floor. The solemn light filtering through from the sky far above touches hanging moss with somber fire. damp undergrowth, rising like a tide to engulf fallen logs and rotting humus, surges with vitality. In this strange half-world, Emily Carr created her own cathedral. The pillars are the trees, the naves and apses, the spaces between them. The vaulted ceiling is formed by their great branches. All is silent, but alive.
Beneath other trees back in Victoria, Emily Carr moved to her final studio in a little cottage only a few yards from the house where she was born. Here she lived in the 30s and early 40s and painted her last and best work. Amid the genial clutter of her workroom, rows of stacked canvases revealed her progress through the British Columbia rainforest in charcoal, oil and watercolor. In the studio, too, were rugs, which she wove in the Indian manner, and pottery, which she made using Indian motifs. Close to three score years and ten, Emily Carr, now at her greatest strength, went for the last time to the scarred hillsides and lush valleys of her native land. As she did so, her painting opened up. It gained the breadth and sweep of absolute certainty. It achieved the vigor of an artist who painted with passion and who knew that no matter how much she painted, there was always more to be done. In her last years, Emily Carr was possessed by the demon of creation. Her output was prolific and filled with a sense of freedom She painted the wide skies above logged over country. The great canyon of the upper Fraser River near Lillooet. The rugged sweep of the caribou country. Swirling skies over Juan de Fuca Strait where the last reaches of Canada open onto the broad and endless Pacific. When she died in 1945, Emily Carr left her brushes and palette to a young Indian painter and her unsold canvases to found scholarships for British Columbia artists. Today it is not only the landscape and the great totems of the Indians that inspire our painters. The canvases of Emily Carr are themselves an inspiration. They show that if an artist feels overwhelmingly the urge to paint, it matters little that he works alone. For from the images of his land, he can create paintings that will always arouse deep emotions in the hearts of his fellow men.